It is good to see everybody here today. My name is Nathan. Welcome to everybody here today. If you are a newcomer, a special welcome to you. And if you just want to take a second to look at the pocket in the uh, chair just in front of you, there should be a card there. That has a number of QR codes on it that you can scan to find out a little bit more about the ministries that we have going on at West London, as well as a connection card that you can fill out just to let us know a little bit more about your visit. Next, we also have a QR code that you can scan for our weekly emails. Uh, that just has the uh, email updates that go out every week with what's going on uh, this Sunday so that you don't have to pay attention to the announcements as much. You already know what's going on and you're informed about that. Next, we have a baptism class happening today at one o'clock in the sanctuary. This is just an information class, so you don't need to worry about getting trapped and committing to be baptized if you attend. Pastor Jude's going to be leading that here in the sanctuary at one o'clock. Again, that's just an information session, so if you'd like to know more about getting baptized and why we believe that that is important, feel free to attend that today at 1 o'clock. Next, Kapora's Conference is approaching very quickly. That's happening in just two weeks here at the church on February 24th and 25th. You can sign up online. It's $50 to register, and that includes lunch on Saturday as well as a free copy of the book. Um, that's going to be a great conference. We have Craig Troxell coming in. He's going to be speaking on his book that you're going to receive if you sign up, and uh, we'd love to see you there. Men, save the date. There is a men's breakfast happening on March 4th. We're planning a morning of food, fellowship, and teaching. Doors open at 8 o'clock, and the event starts at 8.30. If you sign up on Eventbrite before February 26, the cost is $10, but if you wait until after that, then it's going to cost you $15 at the door. All payments are going to be made cash at the door on the day of. That's all that we have for announcements today. We've come here to worship our great God, so let's do that just now. Well, good morning, West London. What a good gift it is to be with each of you in the house of the Lord this morning. In Psalm 126, verse 3, we read, The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. And he has done great things for us. And we are glad. And yet, two verses later, the harder reality of hard days of waiting for great things still to come is laid before us. Verses 5 and 6 of Psalm 126 say, Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. There's a lot of eventually in that verse. Those who sow in tears shall eventually reap with shouts of joy. And he who goes out weeping shall eventually come home with shouts of joy, bearing his sheaves with him. Pastor Jude has been faithful in these last weeks in preaching and showing us through scripture the tension between believing in God's promises but not always seeing them, in obeying the Lord's commands but not always seeing the fruit of that kind of life. And that's what made me meditate on Psalm 126 this week. By faith, West London is a congregation of people who sow in tears. And by faith, West London is a congregation of people who expect to bring home the harvest with shouts of joy. The songs we are singing this morning are shouts of joy kind of songs. And for some of you today, that's exactly where you're at. You are ready to shout, the Lord has done great things for me, and I am filled with joy. So I encourage you to sing out with all your heart and to testify to the goodness of God in your life and to encourage the faith of the brothers and sisters sitting around you. But for some of you today, you are still sowing in tears. But you too can sing with shouts of joy by faith today, even with tears rolling down your cheeks as you sing it. The Lord has done great things, and he will do great things again. And by faith, I will sing these lyrics that don't feel true yet today. But I trust in his promise that one day I will bring home his harvest with shouts of great joy. So by faith this morning, would you sing out your intentions to trust the Lord, to wait for his great things to come, and to thank him for the good things that he has done already. As you are able, please stand and sing with us. you 
so much more knowing that all you have in store for me is good it's good today is the day you have made i will rejoice and be glad in it today is the day you have made i will rejoice and be glad
our praises to you today, in our praises today, that you alone are our hope and our joy and our peace and our strength. You alone get us out of bed every morning. You give us the very lungs full of air to sing those praises. And so, Father, we thank you for the good works that you've done in our lives. Lord, we praise you that you have not given up on us yet, but that by your spirit you sustain us and you uphold us through each and every day of our lives. Father, we praise you for your sustaining grace. We depend on you, Father, to grant us endurance, to finish the race before us with joy, with assurance in who you are and the promises that you've stated. Lord, we ask that you would give us greater faith, greater trust in you, that we would obey you in all the things you call us to do, that we would have hands and feet that are quick to serve you, that we have mouths that overflow with your name and your testimony, that we would be filled with compassion to love the people that you put in our paths, and that you would give us <coughs> patience to wait, eyes of faith to see when the fruit is slow to come, Lord. Give us joy in the waiting. Give us hope in the waiting. Help us to be those who do not shrink back, but who persevere in faith, not because of something we can muster up, but because of who you are. Lord, our souls wait for you. You are our salvation, and in you we rejoice and trust and praise. Amen. This is love I can't explain. This is mercy unreserved. Through your sacrifice so great, I have peace that's undeserved. For the battle has been won, and I fear no shame or loss. Now the state. My steadfast hope that won't be 
I'll ask the kids to come up and join me on the steps. All right. Lots of room down this way, guys. Awesome. All right. Kids, we are on question 48 of our, quest of our catechism, and the question is, what is the church? Now, here's the answer. The church is a community elected for eternal life and united by faith who love, follow, learn from, and worship God together. Now, that's a big definition, but as you look out here, at all these people sitting out here, your family and people you know and other people from the church and lots of people you don't know, we have all come here so that together we could love, follow, learn from, and worship God. And that's why we gather as a church. That's what God has commanded and that's what we intend to do. Our singing this morning was meant for us to worship God together. And now you guys have an opportunity to go to your class and learn from God together. And so the congregation is going to pray for you that God would bless you guys as you go. Congregation, join with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these children. And we, Father God, recognize this morning that they are a vital part of our church family. That they are part of the group who gathers to learn from you and to worship you and to love you and to follow you, Father God. And I pray that you, by your Spirit, would help them, Father God, as they go to their class to learn from you. By your Spirit, use the teachers and the leaders to teach these young ones about you. And we pray, Father God, you would save each one of them, that you would draw them to you. And Father God, watch over them today. And the rest of this week, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, kids, you're dismissed. Have a great time in your class. As the kids are leaving, I'll ask one of our elders, Barry Usher, to come up and lead us to the Lord in prayer.
Good morning, everyone. Join with me in prayer this morning. Loving and gracious God, we come before you in prayer, knowing that you are near to all who call upon you in truth. We're so grateful, Father, for your unwavering presence in our lives and for the comfort that comes from knowing that we can always turn to you. Father, we worship you and bring you our prayers in faith, and we give thanks for your steadfast love and unfailing mercy that's so evident in every circumstance of our lives. Father, help us to make you known and your greatness known to everyone around us. Father, for your deeds are amazing and wonderful, and your name is indeed exalted above all else. You are the creator of the universe, the giver of life, and the sustainer of all things. Your love endures forever, and your faithfulness is beyond measure. And we praise you for your abundant blessings, your protection and provision, and for your unending grace. But, Father, at the same time, our hearts are burdened by the presence of sin in our lives and in the world around us. And we're all too aware of our shortcomings and failures. And we humbly ask for your mercy, desiring to confess our sin and repent so that we would know the freedom and joy that comes from your forgiveness. Father, your word says that your compassions never fail. Forgive us for the times when we've doubted your goodness and mercy toward us, acting as though you don't exist, and neglecting to remember your sovereignty and, and gracious providence in our lives. Even during hardships and painful circumstances, your word says that your compassions never fail and that they are new every morning. Father, your timing is perfect in providing for our needs, and I ask that you would forgive us for failing to trust in you in each circumstance and instead rely on our own strength and ideas to try to navigate through each circumstance, which only tends to produce needless worry and anxiety. Father, change our hearts and enable us to trust in your perfect will and timing. Help us to pray continually as we rest ourselves in you, as we wait on you, and learn each day that you are our good and perfect portion in life. Keep us from the sin of seeking satisfaction apart from you and the truth of your word. Help us to walk closely with you each day, keeping in step with your spirit, eagerly seeking to read and apply the wisdom of your word, remembering that you are good to those who hope in you and to those who seek you. Father, even in the midst of our weakness, we're filled with gratitude for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. He took upon himself the punishment that we deserve, making it possible for us to be forgiven and reconciled to you. Grant us the grace to turn from our sin and follow you with all our hearts, empowered by your spirit, to live in a way that honors your name and demonstrates the transformative power of your love and grace. And Father, we ask this on behalf of our Christian brothers and sisters in Turkey and Syria who are dealing with the devastation of the recent earthquake. We pray for your comfort and peace to surround them in the midst of their pain and loss. Bring your church together in this part of the world to care for each other, as well as minister effectively and practically to the hurting people around them. May your power be on display through your church so that many would come to know you as their Savior and Lord as a result. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here who are experiencing the pain of grief and loss. I think of Pastor Jude and Nicole and their family as they mourn the passing of Nicole's mom. We thank you that she was saved and is now in your presence, but we ask that you would continue to comfort the family with your peace and presence in the coming days. Father, I lift up my brothers and sisters here this morning who are struggling with ongoing physical and mental health issues. I ask for your healing hand to be upon them, to bring comfort to their bodies and peace to their minds. We ask, be it your will, that medical treatments would be successful and for complete restoration of health. Strengthen them to face each day with faith in you, resting in the assurance that you are good and that you are sovereign and you are the one who upholds us with your righteous hand. Father, I also lift up those in prayer facing important decisions in life that need to be made and particularly in the coming weeks, asking for your wisdom and your guidance. We know that you are the source of all wisdom and understanding, and you give it generously to us. Father, continue to lead my brothers and sisters according to your will and keep them from sin. Give them the courage to follow you even when it's difficult or uncomfortable. 
Father, we lift up our missionaries, Steve and Pam Wise, as they serve with Teach Beyond. Keep them safe as they travel in Asia this month. Provide for them the money that they need to cover their expenses. And we ask that you would give them strength and health as they need it to minister to many different lives. And we also pray for our brothers and sisters here in London at Forest City Bible Church and their pastor, Dave Driver. And we thank you for this faithful fellowship and faithful church in London and for their desire to be effective ministers of the gospel. And we ask that you would bless them with patience and faith as they trust in your plans and timing for their, your work through them. May they see their community grow with an increase in young families and, and those from the surrounding community who have yet to hear the gospel. And Father, we also lift up pastors Jude and Daniel, uh, Rand Luca with the Arabic Fellowship, and Dave Dunmore at JSAC this morning as they preach your word. We ask that your truth be proclaimed with clarity and passion, and may it deeply penetrate the hearts of all who listen. May your word take root in our hearts and our minds, transforming our lives as we respond to your call to live out the truth that we hear. Father, help us to recognize your presence here this morning and respond appropriately in worship and in surrender. May our hearts reverence and worship you, recognizing your holiness. Set our hearts on our Savior, Jesus. Direct our wills to follow him as we humbly obey your commands. I pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Here at West London Alliance Church, we do not receive offerings during the course of the service. If you brought that with you this morning, you could deposit it in the box at the back of the sanctuary. It's on your right-hand side as you leave, and that will get taken care of. Uh, I do want to encourage the congregation. Uh, the normal flow of giving at this church, I think, is similar in a lot of churches. Uh, December is amazing. Uh, in fact, this past December was our best December ever. Uh, at least since I've been here, of giving. And that was amazing. And then January comes and February comes, and things get off to a slow start. I only encourage you uh, to remember to give faithfully, to give uh, joyfully, not under compulsion, and regularly. And uh, we trust God in those things, and so I want to encourage you in that. That's how you have always behaved, and uh, I assume it will go forward in the same way. Continue on in our sermon series through the book of Hebrews, focusing in on Hebrews 11, 32 through 40. In just a moment, I'm going to ask Nathan Dunmore to come up and, uh, for the public reading of God's word. But I want to remind the congregation before we hear that, that the author of Hebrews has called the reader and has called us to endure. Now, if you are looking for advice in general on how to endure, the internet offers many tips on how to endure many different things. I started a Google search this week with the phrase, how to endure. And Google finished my sentence with the following, how to endure pain, how to endure torture, how to endure spicy food, how to endure long flights. How to Endure Tattoo Pain. And all of those searches would give you many web pages and many tips on enduring something. Things like six ways to use your mind to endure pain. Strategies for surviving torture. And seven ways to build your spicy food tolerance. There's many ways to endure many different things. And there's no shortage of advice on that, at least if you go on the internet. Now the author of Hebrews also has advice, but his advice is divine. It is divine tips on how to endure. And the author of Hebrews calls us to endure in our journey of faith. And he gives us his suggestions on how we might do that. But those suggestions are God's suggestions on what is required. Faith is the way we endure as followers of Christ. The author has given us examples of this. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses' parents, Moses himself, the Israelites, and Rahab. 
And today he gives us some more examples, including Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, and many more. And so as we hear God's word this morning, let us consider this final grouping of those who endured by faith. And let us be prepared, let us prepare our hearts to learn, even as the author of Hebrews intends us to do. Nathan. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 to 40, reading from the ESV. And what more shall I say? For time would fail to tell me of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy wandering about in deserts and mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Today's examples in Hebrews take us from the judges to the kings to the prophets and even through the time between the Old and New Testaments. And so we will consider these examples of faith as well as faith worked out in regards to exploits and faith worked out in regards to hardships. And we will conclude by looking at how faith connects the Old Testament saints to us. Our first point, judges, kings, and prophets, verse 32. Examples of faith and history and Israel's history continues from the era of the judges until the time of the prophets and to the very beginnings of the New Testament age. Now the author begins this passage with the intention of wrapping up his list of examples of those who had faith and preserved their souls. However, he wants the reader to understand that he could go on and on and on. I hope you guys understand that I could also go on and on and on. I think you know that by experience. He wants the reader to understand in a powerful way by using all these examples of the importance of faith. His rhetorical question, and what more shall I say? emphasizes that there is a lot more that he could say. And yet time would fail him to talk about all the examples of faith in specific and detailed ways. However, he does, as he brings this list to conclusion, mention a few people who by faith did exploits in the narrative of Israel's history. Gideon had faith that God could help him crush the Midianites, even when God reduces his army from 32,000 to just 300. And those 300 were equipped with, with swords, no, axes, no. They were equipped with clay jars and trumpets. And yet Gideon and his army routed the enemy. Barak, despite his initial hesitation, acted by faith in facing a Canaanite army. A Canaanite army that had 900 chariots as well as the rest of the army. And we know from that story that in the midst of a downpour, he prevailed over Sisera and the army of Canaanites. Samson, who was dedicated from birth to the Lord, was empowered by the Spirit of God to perform great uh, feats of great strength and daring and victory by faith. 
By faith he called upon the Lord and avenged himself against the Philistines. Jephthah, he was a mighty warrior from the tribe of Manasseh and from the region of Gilead, who by faith overthrew the Ammonites at a critical time in the history of Israel. And then David. David was Israel's greatest king, and his exploits loom large in the history of Israel. By faith, David faced and defeated Goliath. By faith, he united Israel. By faith, he captured Jerusalem. By faith, he defeated the Philistines. And by faith, he reigned until his son Solomon became king. And Samuel, the last of the judges and the first of the prophets, by faith established the monarchy in Israel. And by faith interceded on behalf of the nation and had his prayers answered. And we go from there, specific names of specific people to a group of people, the prophets, who, if you know your Bible, know includes many who by faith worked miracles and counseled kings and prophesied oracles. Men like Elijah and Elisha and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. These are the heroes of faith who by faith accomplished astounding exploits in God's name. Now, the author of Hebrews lists even more exploits done in faith. But before we get to those, let's pause and consider the heroes who are mentioned by name and the group of prophets as well. These people are certainly notable for their great achievements, for their monumental accomplishments. But they are also notable for their sin and their weakness. These people fell short in many ways. Barak lacked courage to the extent that he would not take up arms against the Canaanites unless Deborah went with him. The weakness of Gideon's faith was seen in his continual asking for signs from God when God already told him what he should do and what God would do for him. Samson's exploits are almost matched by his sexual infidelities and his impulsive acts. He was a rash individual. And that's a trait that he shared with Jephthah, who vowed to sacrifice his own daughter. You can read about Samuel, who promoted his sons, even though he knew they were wicked. And of course, King David committed adultery with Bathsheba and then murdered her husband, Uriah. These heroes of faith certainly didn't earn the title heroes of faith by their stunning virtue or by their unassailable courage. Rather, they accomplished their exploits by faith and by the grace of God. And that reminds those of us who have come to God by faith that faith is a gift of God. R.C. Spruill in his booklet called What is Faith? That little booklet is really an exposition on chapter uh, 11 of Hebrews and I commend that book to you. Uh, if you use uh, digital books, you can go on Amazon and get that book for free. It's called What is Faith by R.C. Spruill. It'll be a great book for you to read and as we finish off Hebrews 11. Well, Spruill highlights the grace involved in the gift of faith. And he does so by pointing to the Westminster Catechism, which informs its readers that saving faith is the grace of faith whereby the elect are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls. The phrase grace of faith reminds us that faith is a gift. If you're a believer, you are of those who do not shrink back, but have faith and preserve your souls. But don't soak in the sewer of pride and attribute your faith to your own virtue or your own valor. Rather, bathe in the basin of humility that comes from knowing and acknowledging that God's grace to you is the gift of faith. Now, the sins and weaknesses of the heroes of faith also speak to those of you 
who don't have faith this morning, for those of you who know you're not a believer, who don't consider yourself a disciple of Christ, perhaps you believe that you are not good enough, not strong enough, not brave enough to have faith in God. Well, if you thought that, you would be absolutely correct. You are not good enough, not strong enough, or brave enough. None of us are. But faith isn't earned. It's received. And so this morning, you can pray to God, and you can ask him for faith to believe. Ask God to help you to have faith in Jesus. Faith that he is the Son of God who died that sinners like you and me might be forgiven. Pray for faith to trust Jesus and to trust in his work of redemption. And having prayed for faith, believe. And if you have questions about what it means to put your faith in Jesus, please speak to me after the service or to one of our staff members. The judges, the kings, the prophets, all accomplished great exploits by faith. And the author, knowing that he cannot recite all of the people who accomplished exploits by faith, decides to proceed with a list of the mere exploits in rapid fashion. Point number two, faith in exploits. Verse 33 through 35a. Not only are there many more heroes of faith, there are many more exploits of faith that the author only mentions in passing. Through faith, kingdoms were conquered like those by Joshua and David and the judges. Through faith, justice was enforced, like the justice brought on Egypt in the time of Moses or on the Canaanites in the time of Barak. Through faith, promises were obtained as the nation grew in population and as the nation conquered the promised land and as the nation had their kings crowned. Through faith, the mouths of lions were stopped in the days of Daniel. Through faith, the power of fire was quenched when Daniel's friends, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, were thrown into the fiery furnace and yet remained unharmed. Through faith, the edge of the sword was escaped as David escaped Saul and as Elijah escaped Jezebel. Through faith, weakness was made strong as Samson, even after his hair was cut and his eyes were removed and he was imprisoned, still brought down the temple of Dagon and destroyed many Philistines. Through faith, wars were won and armies were put to flight, as seen in the lives of Gideon and Jephthah and David and Solomon and Elijah and Isaiah. And through faith, women received resurrected loved ones in the ministries of Elijah and Elisha. The author of Hebrews obviously sees great value in bringing before the eyes of those he wants to endure the testimony of God's work. The testimony of God's work through exploits of faith. And therefore, I think we could be helped as we endeavor to endure by faith. We could be helped by remembering not only the exploits of faith of those who were in Old Testament times, but remembering the exploits of faith of New Testament times, even our times. You have heard me, I think many times, speak of the elders' prayer list. And I believe I have mentioned that what comes after the list of requests is a list of answered prayers, which I believe can serve us this morning as a list of exploits accomplished by faith. By faith in God, which is a gift. I'm going to use that list. I'm going to generalize it. I'm talking about the list of answered prayers. I'm going to generalize it. I'm going to anonymize it. And I'm going to share it with you as an encouragement to endure. At Westland Alliance Church, just in regards to the elders' prayer list and the list of answered prayers, we have seen, by faith, ministry training completed. By faith, the gospel was preached and churches strengthened in Iraq and Indonesia. By faith, new occupations and vocations were embarked upon. By faith, musicals extolling Jesus were performed. 
By faith, the love of Jesus was spread in India and Peru and the Philippines. By faith, women conceived and children were born. By faith, alliance workers' licenses were earned. By faith, fundraising for gospel work was completed. By faith, foster children were adopted. By faith, pastoral training was completed and new mission work was started in the education field. By faith, men and women have been married. By faith, men and women have preserved their marriages. By faith, ministry resumed at nursing homes. By faith, evangelism took place in Chile. By faith, a church was planted. By faith, Sunday school ministry resumed. By faith, refugees arrived in Canada. By faith, trainees became official workers. By faith, budgets were surpassed. By faith, loved ones came to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And by faith, disciples of Jesus were baptized. A very practical application from the efforts of the author to encourage the readers pertains to this tabulating and recalling past exploits accomplished by faith in God. This is something we should do. We should rejoice in the victories and testify to God's goodness and to God's grace in our lives and in the life of this church. And that can be an encouragement to you. Why not sit down by yourself this afternoon or perhaps with your family and make note of all of the faith-fueled exploits you have experienced and do that as a means to help you endure. This would be a great activity to do with your children. Maybe a great activity to do on family day. To sit down with the kids and say, what has God accomplished in our family? What have we seen God do by faith? Now, as you know, and as the author of Hebrews knows... The life of faith is not all exploits. Sometimes, oftentimes, the life of faith is the life of enduring hardship and suffering. Point number three, faith to endure, verse 35b through 38. By faith, God's people endure hardship and suffering. The author follows up this list of those who by faith did great exploits with the sobering truth that though certainly God's people have accomplished great things and endured their time on this earth by experiencing great victories and successes, God's people are nevertheless a pilgrim people in exile. And this fallen world is not their home. And thus our endurance on earth is also an endurance through hardship and through difficulties and through suffering. Puritan theologian John Owen, in his four-volume commentary on Hebrews, explains the intent of the author this way. He proceeds in the next place unto instances quite of another nature, in which were more immediately suited unto the condition of the Hebrews. For hearing of these great and glorious things, they might be apt to think that they were not so immediately concerned in them, for their condition was poor, persecuted, exposed to all evils, and death itself for the, uh, for the profession of the gospel. Their interest, therefore, was to inquire what help, what relief from faith they might expect in that condition. What will faith do when men are to be oppressed, persecuted, and slain? Wherefore, the apostle, applying himself directly unto their condition, with what they suffered and further feared on the account of their profession of the gospel, produces a multitude of examples, as so many testimonies under the power of faith and safeguarding and preserving the souls of believers under the greatest sufferings that human nature can be exposed to. Now the author's goal remains the same as it has all along, warning against falling away and encouraging to endure. Now, we can examine these verses by reviewing what the heroes of faith suffered, how they acted in their sufferings, 
the grounds of their faithfulness and their character as they suffered. Now, it is very likely in listing, uh, listing these hardships that the, the author is pulling examples from the Old Testament times, but really in the time between the end of the Old Testament and the start of the New Testament. We can't know for sure. Nevertheless, what is it that these people suffered? Well, the heroes of faith were tortured to death, mocked, flogged, chained and imprisoned, stoned, sawn in two, oppressed, afflicted, mistreated, and disenfranchised. Now, like I said, most of the commentators think the examples that he's thinking about here come in the intertestamental period, that is, the time between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New. But I don't think it's necessary for us to pursue those specific details this morning. They're a bit speculative, and to be honest, they occur in non-canonical writings. We can simply note that God's faithful people suffered greatly by faith. The significance of this aspect of enduring faith is evident. And that even the saints who did great exploits that were mentioned earlier, we know also suffered. Samson was captured, imprisoned, and blinded. And made a slave for labor. David was often pursued with attempts regularly being made to kill him. He was betrayed by his son. He fled his throne when his son led a coup. And so even those who did exploits suffered. Exploits for the Christian are a possibility, but suffering for the Christian is a certainty. And we must endure How did these faithful ones act in their sufferings? These examples are examples of faith. And we can see how they acted when the author reports that they refused to accept their release. And we need to understand what this release is. This is a release from the persecution, a release from the suffering. But it is only for those who would renounce their faith. And we've seen this through the, the the history of the Christian church. That persecution will fall on Christians and they will be offered a reprise if, if they recant their faith. John Owen in his commentary suggests that the martyr Blandina is a great example of this. Blandina was a young woman who was martyred during the reign of Marcus Aurelius. Now, some Christians during this time in the mid to late 2nd century renounced their faith so that they could avoid suffering, but Blandina was not one of them. Though suffering more than most, she held her faith firm until the end. Now, she was slight of build. She was frail, and her friends worried she would not be able to handle the pain and the torture and that she might recant. But the report comes down that it was the executioners who became exhausted from the effort that they exerted in torturing her. She wouldn't recant. She had but one confession. I am a Christian and nothing wrong is done among us. She suffered at the hands of the torturers, but she didn't die. And so her tortured body was suspended on a stake and exposed to wild beasts, which did not kill her. And so she was thrown back in jail. Now, on the last day of these scheduled and organized persecutions, Blandina remained the last Christian alive. And the report of her death is as follows. After the scourging, after the wild beasts, and after the roasting seat, she was finally enclosed in a net, and thrown before a bull, and having been tossed about by the animal, but feeling none of the things which were happening to her on account of her hope and firm hold upon what had been entrusted to her in her communion with Christ, she eventually was sacrificed. The bull did not kill her, and so she was finished off with a dagger. She wouldn't accept release. She wouldn't renounce her faith. Faithfulness is seen in fealty to God. 
the faithful do not renounce him even in the face of death. That's what the author of Hebrews is conveying here. Well, what were the grounds on which they endured? The ground of their endurance in the midst of suffering was that they might rise again to a better life. That was the ground of their faithfulness in the midst of suffering. They might rise again to a better life. This, brothers and sisters, is assurance of things hoped for. This is a conviction of things not seen. This is the heart posture of Paul when he wrote Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 11. He writes, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. The faithful keep their eyes on the prize. The reward that is promised by God is always kept in view. They look to rise again to a better life. That was the ground of their endurance. Well, what was their character as they suffered? Their character in suffering was such that the author says the world was not worthy of them. Now, much of the persecution that Christians have experienced throughout the ages was because their enemies deemed that these believers were not worthy of the world. The world hated Jesus. They will hate his disciples. He's clear on that. And yet we remind ourselves this morning, brothers and sisters, that this world is God's world. He created it, and he reigns over it, and his determination is final. And through the writer of Hebrews, the sovereign God over all the earth declares that the reality is as such. The world is not worthy of those who suffer by faith. Now in light of these examples and the admonition from God's word to endure by faith, the trials and difficulties and hardships we are sure to face Let's consider three things that can help us do just that. My prayer is that for those of you who are currently suffering, which is some of you, and those of you who will suffer, which is all of you, that these will be practical helps for you this morning. They come from John Owen. Let's lean on him again for our application this morning. Owen suggests that we can work our faith with the aim of enduring in the midst of trials by, one, maintaining a steady view of the promised eternal glory. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 says, For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Owen says we can work our faith with the aim of enduring hardships by comparing present sufferings with the eternal miseries of the damned in hell. Now, I don't think I've ever done that. I don't think I've ever, in the midst of suffering, considered what the suffering I truly deserve would be like. But I can see why it would be helpful. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. I think that might be a helpful comparison for people of faith to make in the midst of their suffering. Finally, Owen says we can work our faith with the aim of enduring hardship by holding a firm persuasion that these sufferings shall make no separation between God and us. Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's three practical things we can do in the midst of suffering to help us endure by faith. So by faith, the people of God endure. By faith, the people of God accomplish great exploits. And by faith, all of God's people, both Old Testament saints and New Testament saints, await the fulfillment of what God has promised. Final point, number four, faith with us, verse 39 and 40. By faith, all of God's people await the fulfillment of all of God's promises. The final verses of chapter 11 accomplish three things. They summarize this extended illustration on faith and the many examples brought forward. They connect the saints of the Old Testament to those of the New Testament. And they recognize the promise that Jesus fulfilled and will fulfill. Now the fact that in these verses the author summarizes is clear and that he revisits the idea of commendation, the commendation of God, the approval of the Lord in regards to the faith of his people. We read, in all these, though commended through their faith. Now we looked at that commendation early on in, in, the chapter, in chapter 11 in the sermons, in this beginning of this teaching of faith. We saw that Old Testament saints were commended by God because they carried about inside themselves a sense of assurance and a sense of trust about the things God had promised, the things that they were certain would come about, the things that they waited for with longing. And the Old Testament saints were commended by God because they had an inner, firm, and fixed belief in the things of God that they could not see, whether that was past, present, or future. And we considered the words of one commentator who said there is an indissoluble connection between divine approval and faith. And so this list of examples basically comes to an end. And the author reiterates that by faith these people receive the commendation of God. But he also wants to connect the Old Testament heroes of faith from the past with his readers. And by extension, he connects them with us because we are disciples of Christ. He says, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. And by the grace of God, the perfection of the Old Testament saints was not accomplished until the time of the New Testament and therefore includes New Testament believers. You should know what the perfection they sought was. The perfection they sought was access to God and a confidence to draw near to Him. That's what we've learned in Hebrews. In essence, that perfection they sought was salvation. And this could only come through Jesus Christ and His work of redemption. This salvation, this perfection, is received by faith. For all the people of God, the Old Testament saints were saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, dimly perceived. New Testament saints are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, explicitly revealed. And we share this connection with the heroes of faith. They would not be made perfect. They could not be made perfect apart from us, not because of us, but because of Christ. This promise of access to God, this promise of salvation, was a promise that could only be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. But even that promise's complete fulfillment, fulfillment is something we still wait for. The Old Testament's faithful, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Now, some of them received particular promises in their lifetime. Noah escaped the flood with his family. Isaac was born to Abraham and Sarah. The people of Israel 
defeated Jericho. Rahab was spared when Jericho was defeated. And so the saints of old received some promises, but they didn't receive the promise. Not till Christ came. Not till Christ gloriously fulfilled what was necessary for God's people to be forgiven of their sins and to be reconciled to God was the promise received. And what a glorious fulfillment of that promise the work of Christ is. It is glorious in grace in that we did not deserve salvation, nor could we earn it. It is glorious as a substitutionary sacrifice in which Jesus is punished for our sins and receives the penalty that we deserve. It's glorious in its redemption whereby Jesus' payment of the penalty frees us from slavery to sin. It's glorious in its propitiation whereby Jesus removes the wrath of God from us so that it could fall on himself. It's glorious in its reconciliation of rebellious sinners to their holy creator, to whom now we can come boldly and with confidence. It was and is a promise which was fulfilled in a manner too glorious for us to completely understand. And yet, that promise still awaits complete fulfillment. Those who look for the promise are looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. The faithful people of God look for the final fulfillment of God's promise by seeking a homeland, a better country that is a heavenly one. They all await this fulfillment. We await this fulfillment, for we believe that God has prepared for us a city. So the promise has been received through the coming of Christ, through his sacrificial death, through the salvation he accomplished. But the promise will be received at the second coming of Christ. When we come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the gift of faith, the grace of faith. We did not deserve it. We cannot earn it. And yet you graciously gave it. To us. I pray this morning that you would give many more the gift of faith. I pray for those who feel they aren't good enough or strong enough or brave enough that they will recognize they aren't and that faith is a gift and that they will pray for it and that they will believe. I pray that you would help us to acknowledge and to rejoice in exploits done by faith. Thank you for the work that you do in our midst. Thank you for the work that you have done in this congregation. And I think, Father God, this morning, I pray most of all for those in suffering, either now or in the future. I pray, Father God, that you would help them to work their faith by maintaining a steady view of the promise of eternal glory. That they would regularly contrast their present hardships with the misery of eternal suffering. And that, Father God, they will hold firmly to the conviction that suffering will not separate them from your love. I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're able, please stand and sing with us. I have a home eternal home but for now I walk this broken world you walked it first you know our pain but you show hope can rise again up from the grave abide with me abide with me don't let me fall and don't let go walk with me and never leave ever close god abide with me there 
joy abide with me. We'll weep no more, sing for joy abide with me. The grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea, and I am saved on this solid ground. The Lord is my salvation. strength will help me scale these walls. I'll see the dawn of the rising sun. The Lord is my salvation. Yeah. 
Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> 